Uh, just the microphone for the recording, but not the one for the room. Uh, well, it's great to have you all here. Uh, and uh, we'll start this uh, Algebraic Geometry in Mexico 2017 uh, conference in Oaxaca and PXM uh, with uh, Juan Manuel Burgos from, uh, from Mexico, Simbestad, and he's going to be speaking about Diagonal Theory of the Universal Hyperbolic Lamination. Juan Manuel. Thank you very much, Ernesto. Uh, well, first of all, um, it's a great pleasure being here today. It's uh, mostly a great honor being the, being the opening band of the event. So, thank you very much, the, the organizers. Uh, this is a joint work with Professor Alberto Berkowski. He will be here on, on Saturday. And I'd like to comment about some very fresh cook result we just got. Just, uh, just to motivate, let me say, very general uh, and well-known material for the, to, to motivate the problem. Consider a holomorphic covering of Riemann surfaces, uh, a Riemann a, a genus G prime curve covering a genus G curve, holomorphically. And well, ranging over all the complex structures of the genus G curve, the pullback map defines a holomorphic map between the corresponding moduli spaces. And of course, uh, the relation of the genus is uh, through the degree of the map P by the following formula. Very basic uh, stuff. Uh, and in particular, if, if the embedding of the moduli is not the identity, we have this relation here. What it is really interesting is that this bound is optimal. optimal for genus G greater than or equal 6, and it is the content of the Aramagiona-Soto theorem. It's a, very, it, it's, it's a very strong rigidity result. <coughs> and the moral of this is that uh, holomorphic maps between moduli spaces is a very delicate thing, because uh, a priori, you have enough room for, uh, for embeddings, but it turns out by, by the theorem that there are none of them if the constraint is not verified. So, And well, with this in mind, we prove the following. That there is a branch holomorphic Keller isometric covering, uh, covering the sense in, in the orbifold sense for every genus greater than or equal to, and discovering factors through the alternate product of the genus two curves, of, of the moduli of genus two uh, compact curves. Uh, and actually, this is a corollary of the following result. Um, respect to the respective Bile-Peterson metrics on the Teichmuller spaces, there is a Keller isometric by holomorphism between the G minus one times copies of the Teichmuller space of genus, G, genus two curves and the Teichmuller of genus G curves. And moreover, this is a corollary of the main results of, of our work. There is uh, respect to the renormalized by, by Peterson metric, there is a Keller isometric by holomorphism between the between the Sullivan Steichmuller space of the universal hyperbolic lamination and the continuous function of the profinite completion of the genus two curve fundamental group and the Teichmuller space of the genus two uh, curves. That's our main result. And moreover, in, the, in a sense, I will explain at, 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 at the end of the talk, uh, this result is, is, is functorial in respect to the, 
to the inverse limit maps of the profinite completion. What is C? Continuous. C is uh, continuous. <coughs> well, just to, just to fix uh, common language and notation, let me talk about very, very well known and standard material, but it's just to fix notation. Uh, consider a Riemann surface sigma. Um, how we deform its complex structure? Well, we are looking for uh, the construction of the moduli space. There are, there are mainly three ways of, contrast, of constructing moduli space. One is through Hilbert schemes and geometric invariant theory. The other one would be via Torelli maps and, and Jacobian varieties. We will follow the Teichmuller approach. So uh, consider the Poincaré uniformization and the representation of the deck transformation that is a, a function group representation into the hyperbolic isometries of the Poincaré disk. It's a faithful representation. Um, and geometrically, a picture one should have in the head uh, every time we talk about deck transformations or Faction group representations is uh, tessellations. Um, this is the, the tessellation of the genus two curves, this is the tessellation of the one cusp torus, and the tessellation of the three cusp uh, torus. We will focus mainly on the first case, on the tessellation of the genus two curves, because we don't want parabolic elements in our function group. We don't want elements like this, uh, cusps like this. Well, um, uh, an L infinity, one comma minus one differential along the top will be called just a differential. We will say that mu is a G automorphic differential if it is a differential and it is invariant under translations of the faction representation. And we will denote the space of, of all those differentials, uh, L infinity G. <coughs> and we will say that mu is a Beltrami differential if, if its supremum norm is strictly less than one. And these are the important guys because this will be our deformation parameters. And just a remark, the pullback of a differential in, in the curve um, lifts in, in, to the disk as a geotomorphic differential uh, in the Poincaré disk. So uh, now we have our deformation parameters, how we actually realize a deformation with, uh, with a given parameter. And well, a Beltrami differential can be seen as an infinite measurable field of ellipses, uh, actually a measurable field of class of homothetical ellipses. We don't care about the, the, the radius, only the eccentricity, the, the, the relation between the major and minor axis. And this is how the Beltrami differential, the mu, encrypts the ellipse, uh, ellipse data. Consider the Alfors-Verse equation, uh, Alfors-Verse equation in the, in the weak sense, in the distributional sense. <coughs> and a natural question is, is there a solution in the, in the Poincaré disk of this, of this equation? And geometrically speaking, uh, it is equivalent to ask if there is a map uh, is straightening all the field of ellipses into infinitesimal circles. That's, that's the, the equivalent notion of, of a solution. Uh, as, as you remember that the field of ellipses is L infinity. It is not, not continuous and uh, at first sight, there is no right for the existence of an F uh, like that. And well, uh, it results the, that the Alfors 
first theorem answers positively our, our question. There are quasi-conformal homeomorphisms. There are not only solutions, but they are homeomorphisms to the Alford-Schwarz equation. And moreover, these solutions uniquely extend to a homeomorphism in, on the boundary of the disk. And there is a unique solution fixing three arbitrarily points. Uh, we completely arbitrarily fix one i and minus one. We will call a solution like that a canonical solution. Uh, remark, uh, if the differential is geautomorphic, the solution will be G equivariant. If mu equals zero, then we have Cauchy Riemann equations in the weak sense. By Bayer theorem, F is a holomorphic solution in the strong sense. And there are there are non-trivial uh, by holomorphism, non-trivial automorphisms of the curve, and there are at most 84 times g minus one of them. Uh, it's an open problem to know uh, at which particularly g's this, this is an equality. That, that, that's an open problem. Well, in particular, abusing of notation for every differential, for every, for every Beltrami differential, we have a quasi-conformal deformation. And finally, we deform the complex structure in this way. Given a complex structure, we deform it like this, and the resulting curve will be called the, the deformed curve. Uh, well, equivalent, we can write it in the complex structure. And a natural question, are we, are we really deforming? Uh, is there redundancy in the parameters? And we say that uh, two deformations are equivalent if the following triangle commutes um, and H is an orientation preserving homeomorphism. The equivalence classes constitute a coarse modelized space uh, of the genus G curves. Uh, it is coarse because uh, of, of, of the thing I said before, we have non-trivial automorphisms, so there is no universal family, and we, we don't have a fine moduli. And to produce a fine moduli, we strengthen the relation. Uh, instead of taking a homeomorphism, we take a, a homeomorphism isotopic to the identity, and that will be the Teich-Muller equivalence relation. And this is a very useful characterization of the Teich-Muller relation. Two deformations are Teich-Muller equivalent, if and only if the canonical solutions coincide on the boundary. It's a very useful characterization. Well, the above relation, the above condition defines uh, an equivalence relation in the space of Beltrami differentials. And because of all previously said, we have the Alford-Schwarz analytic model of the Teich-Miller space. It's a deep theorem, very deep theorem, that the Teich-Miller space is a complex domain of complex dimension 3G minus 3. Very deep theorem because the model A space, uh, it's, a, uh, it's an orbifold. Uh, we have these this orbifold points that don't allow us to work uh, very comfortably. And the Hummler space is just a, a ball in, in complex space. It's, it's the nicest thing you can think of. Well, and, and naturally, the relationship with the uh, moduli space is like this. The quotient of teich miller space by the mapping class, uh, mapping class group action produces the, gives the moduli space, and the mapping class group is the quotient of the uh, positively oriented homeomorphism, quotient the isotopic to the identity ones. And if we see the moduli space as, as, as a stack, we can say that the mapping class group is actually the, the fundamental group. 
Um, if we forget about the functional representation, I mean forget about the tessellation and, 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 and the curve, and we repeat formally all the previous construction, we get the universal Teichmuller space. And it is useful because it is universal in the sense that it contains all of the previous finite dimensional uh, Teichmuller space. Um, the problem is that this space is too big. It is a non-separable space containing all of the previous finite dimensional ones. So uh, a natural thing to, to, to do is, well, to see if there is something in the middle. Uh, well, uh, we put this information in the, in the freezer for a while, and now we talk about what the hyperbolic lamination is. Uh, consider the inverse system. I, I am in the preliminary section. I am still talking about preliminaries. Uh, consider the inverse system of finite index subgroups of the fundamental group. G will denote along all the talk the fundamental group and the inverse system with its inclusions. Then for every finite index subgroup, consider the diagonal action on the pile of disks. And the quotient gives a, a Riemann surface, so we have the, the functor that for every uh, finite index subgroup gives me a, a finite holomorphic covering of sigma. That is because the functional representation the diagonal action is equivariant respect to the faction representation. And because all of these constructions are functorial, we actually have an inverse system of finite holomorphic coverings. That's the picture uh, you should have in your head. The, the tower of finite holomorphic coverings. Well, uh, just we want to take the, the inverse limiting here. But first, consider the profinite completion of the, of the group G. It's, it's defined as, as that inverse limit, ranging over all finite index subgroups. And because the function group is residually finite, the completion is a group extension, and we have a dense immersion. The collection of all uh, fin finite index subgroups is a neighborhood system of the identity, and by translation, it defines a topology on the group whose completion is the deeper finite completion just defined. And as a topological space, this is nothing else than uh, a Cantor set. Uh, you can think of the Cantor set you like most, and G infinity will be homeomorphic to that because of the universality of <coughs> Cantor sets. What really distinguishes one Cantor from another is its group structure. Topologically, they are all the same. And the group G infinity is an ultrametric space. It has an ultra ultrametric metric. It is, it is constructed like, like this. Uh, consider the cofinal inverse systems of normal subgroups um, such that each normal subgroup is the intersection of all subgroups of index less than or equal to n. And that defines a valuation on the group. With that uh, valuation in, in in the very well-known standard procedure, we construct the ultrametric metric. Um, ah, well, just just a comment. Uh, uh, don't get confused of this theory with a geometric group theory. This has nothing to do at all with uh, with a Cayley graph. The, to, to see the, the group structure with the word metric has nothing to do with this metric. In, in the Cayley graph, the Cantor structure is at the boundary. And here, the whole group is a Cantor set. So it, it, it really has nothing to do. 
Um, well, by the functionality of the construction, we get this. Ah, sorry. We define the universal hyperbolic lamination as the inverse limit of the finite covering tower. And by functionality, we have that expression in here. This is the, this is the pile of disk with G infinity as the, as the fiber, a, a Cantor set fiber, and the diagonal action. And this is a lamination whose leaves are densely immersed disks. The leaf space is the quotient of the profinite completion, uh, quotient the, the group. And, and people familiar with the Kronecker foliation, the irrational slope foliation on the torus, will immediately recognize the, the problems on, on this space. This is what is called a bad quotient. Because from, from its topology, almost nothing is recovered. You get stuck in there. But in the non-commutative geometry context, if you see this space as a groupoid, encrypting the, the quotient data, you can calculate the convolution algebra, and that will be the non-commutative model of this space. And it's a, very power, uh, it's, it's a very powerful thing. In the Kronecker foliation, the convolution algebra of the leaf space gives you nothing else than uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, you get the, the Heisenberg re relation. So it's a very interesting question to, to calculate the convolution algebra of this space, what, what, what it should be. I, I don't have any idea of what is the convolution algebra of this. And the following is a picture you should have in mind of the, of the lamination. Uh, I like to think the hyperbolic lamination as a borrowed genus 2 surface with, with fiber, the Cantor set G infinity. If you make a zoom of, the, of that fuzzy curve, you see the decanter. And, but, but the monodromy, it's very well, the monodromy of the lamination is a group, is a group structure of the profinite completion. Well, define the base leaf of the, of the lamination as a distinguished leaf there is the following one. It's a, it's a leaf that contains the, the neutral element of the, of the group. And define the embedded disk as the disk, but with the coarser topology that is the initial topology of the, the, the embedding topology of the base leaf. And its basic open sets are those sets in there. This is a picture like this. Have the Poincare disk, uh, the fundamental domain. <coughs> These are geodesics in the disk, blah, blah, blah. And a basic open set will be something like this. This is the U. And it re repeats itself countably many times, accumulating in the, in the ideal boundary. Well, and, and by definition, uh, with this topology, the, the base leaf is an embedding. And because, because the identity map is continuous, we have an embedding of the continuous functions of the embedded disk into the continuous functions of the disk. And this will be called the limit automorphic functions. And what, what limit auto, uh, automorphic functions are good for? Well, they are good for the following. Um, 
we can see a function is limit automorphic if and only if it is a pullback by the base lift of a continuous function on the elimination. So instead of thinking about continuous functions on the elimination, you just think about limit automorphic functions. That is uh, much easier. And well, item two just says, just justifies the, the name for this for these functions, it is limit automorphic if and only if it is the uniform limit of automorphic of, of an automorphic net. And well, uh, from now on, uh, I will talk about uh, about new stuff that we need to prove our main results. We uh, we finished the, the preliminaries. And well, we have this, uh, this chain of, of proper inclusions. And Dennis Sullivan defines his Teichmuller space of the lamination as the closure of, of the inductive limit. What we want to do now is to reproduce the theory of, of compact Riemann surfaces to the theory, to the category of compact laminations, compact Riemann laminations. That is what we want to do. And in particular, we want an Alforsberg model, an Alforsberg analytic model for this space. That is what we are looking for. And for that, we need these objects in here consider the representation of the fundamental group in the space um, of L infinity of, 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 of differentials. And con the representation is just a pullback of the function representation. And a differential whose orbit is continuous respect to the profinite topology of G will be called limit automorphic. And the space of limit automorphic differentials will be denoted by L infinity uh, delta embedding. Uh, don't take this uh, literally. Uh, this is just notation. This, this, is, this is nothing else than, than notation. Uh, in concrete, uh, that definition means the following. Just to, just to get uh, j just to assimilate the definition, uh, consider the following very simple example. Consider the real line uh, acting on the, on the space of L infinity functions on the real line just by translation. So, um, an element of L infinity will be the, the orbit of an element of L infinity will be continuous respect to the translation action if and only if it has a, rep, a uniform continuous representative. So we are, we are codifying the continuity notion via an action. That is very useful because we are not in, in a space of functions, we are in a space of, of equivalence classes, so we need, uh, we need that uh, technicality. Well, the space of limit automorphic differentials is a Banach subspace of the space of differentials. And proposition, the following is an analytic model for the Teichmiller space in the category of Freeman laminations and is equivalent to Sullivan's Teichmiller space. I mean, you can construct in the same way as we did before in the classical category of curves. Uh, the same construction, but in the category of Freeman laminations. We will, you, you will get a Teichmuller space, a moduli space, a, map, a mapping class group, uh, all, all the same. What we say is that um, the Teichmuller space you construct in that way coincides with the, Teich, with the Sullivan's Teichmuller space, and now we have an Alforsberg model for that, relating those models.
Well, the next problem is what metric should we put on the Teichmuller space of the lamination? And this has uh, several problems. The first problem is that you naively could think that the Bill Peterson metric on the universal Teichmuller space, the T1 I defined previously, uh, works in the in the Teichmuller space of the lamination. Uh, well, it is completely false because of, of a very basic thing. The, the Bile Peterson on the universal Dijkmuller space is not even defined. It works only in what is called the smooth Dijkmuller space. That is the, the one characterized by this condition that the infinitesimal deformations are C3 half plus epsilon smooth. Well, uh, a second approach would be consider two limit automorphic differentials, consider the respective nets of automorphic uh, differentials converging uniformly. Uh, at every stage, you have uh, a Weil Peterson metric, and you just take the limit. Well, that limit gives you nothing because it is zero or it just blows up to infinity. So it, it cannot distinguish anything. And so we defined what we call the renormalized by Peterson metric. That is the same idea as before, taking limits, but at every stage we renormalize by the, um, by the index of, the, of G prima in G, the index of the subgroup. And, well, uh, theorem, it is well defined. It doesn't depend on the automorphic nets, uh, of the chosen automorphic nets, and it converges for every pair of limit automorphic differentials. So now we have a, a good degenerate metric in, the, in, in, in L infinity and a well defined metric in the Teichmuller. Of course, it, it, it has the same problems as in the classical case. It is not uh, a complete metric, um, but it is, it, is, uh, it is complete in the, uh, in, in the convex sense. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to say it. It is convex complete. Uh, for every pair of points, you have a unique geodesic, but it is not uh, geodesically complete. By Hofrino, it is not uh, topologically complete either. So. Um, well, an important remark, the metric we just construct is an extension of the classical by peterson metric on geotomorphic differentials. Uh, as a non-trivial immediate result of that construction, we have a generalization of the Nack-Berkhofsky embedding. Consider the, the complex analytic quadjoint orbit and well, it's a theorem that it embeds um, holomorphically and Keller isometric in the universal Dijkmuller space and it generalized the previous result that it is transversal to the Dijkmuller space of the lamination. And well, uh, finally, we are in position to enunciate the, our main results. Uh, theorem A, the, the one I talked at the introduction, respect to the renormalized metrics, renormalized by Peterson metrics, there is a Keller isometric by holomorphism. And this result can be seen as uh, Keller coordinates of the of the Teichmuller space of the lamination. Well, uh, Teichmuller valued Keller coordinates. And it has the very nice properties that these coordinates uh, are functorial in this sense. Functorial in the respect to the inverse limit maps. Well, idea of the proof. 
uh, for every differential, define the function that at each, at each group element, uh, you take the respective translation by the function representation. Lemma, the differential is limit automorphic if and only if this map just defined extend, uh, continuously extends to the profinite completion. That's a very useful characterization. Uh, remember, remember this notation, the, the hat will be the continuous extension to the profinite completion. Consider a fundamental domain, este, some, something like this, of the G action on the disk. And because of G equi equivariance, the, the product will be a fundamental domain of the diagonal action of the, of the bundle. And define the, define the following map, a uh, map from the, this continuous function space into the limit automorphic differential space, such that um, given a continuous function, she, you will get a, a limit automorphic differential satisfying this property here, that they coincide in the fundamental domain. We define the valid Peterson metric on the, on the <coughs> continuous space functions as usual. Here the, the measure is the hard measure, the unique normalized hard measure on the profinite completion group. Uh, the finite completion is a locally compact group, so it has a hard measure. Um, and lemma. This, this is the main lemma of the main theorem. Respect to the Weil Peterson and renormalized Weil Peterson metrics, the map F is an isometric isomorphism. And well, finally, recall that the set of limit automorphic differentials equivalent to zero equals the set of renormalized re Weil Peterson null vectors. Actually, this is one of the of the motivations for defining Bile Peterson metric. It's a characterization of, of the uh, equivalent to zero differentials via geometry, via a metric. And well, because of the lemma, these null vectors are mapped one to one, so the map F descends to a map in the Teichmuller spaces. And that's the theorem. And we'll recall theorem B, the G minus one times alternating product of the moduli space of two compact Riemann surfaces. It's a complex analytic Keller isometric branch covering. Recall that everything is in the orbifold sense again. Of two compact Riemann surfaces. And the idea of the proof is to use masur wolf theorem uh, it is the analog of Royden's theorem for Bile Peterson metric. It says that the mapping class group of a surface is isomorphic to the positively oriented Bile Peterson uh, isometries of its corresponding Teichmuller space. And then by theorem A, it's a very simple thing to, to do the math in here, we have the following subgroup of the mapping, of the mapping class group. And in particular, we have the following branch covering. Uh, recall that the moduli space is just the quotient of Teichmuller space by its mapping class group. So uh, we get rid the result. And thank you very much. Yes. You also have a process in the moduli space, uh, 
corresponding to that? No, uh, no. There is no analog of uh, universal moduli, but there is an analog of uh, moduli of delamination, and it goes like this. Recall that uh, you can uh, you can do the parallel construction we did in the category of Riemann surfaces in the case of Riemann uh, laminations. So it is natural to have a Teichmüller space and it is natural to have a moduli space. And the relation is the same. Uh, the moduli space of the lamination equals the Teichmüller space of the lamination quotient the mapping glass group and the very interesting thing in here about the mapping glass group this is a this is a, a theorem of uh, Chris Oden It is isomorphic to the group of virtual automorphisms of the fundamental group of the surf of the of the surface. Recall that you have the lamination. And it covers the, the, the base, the, the genus 2 surface. And this is the moduli space you, you were asking for. Any other questions? Thank you. And we have a five minute break.